Today I'm speaking to Javier Torres, the top-ranked male dancer of Northern Ballet, and we're going to talk about his early life in Cuba, his arrival in Leeds with Northern Ballet, and his future plans. So, Javier. Hello. You've exchanged um, an island famous for its sunshine for an island famous for its rain. So, how did that come about? That is a decision that I'm still thinking about it. Like, if, if it was a good decision, that changed, but I think it was. Um, well, that came by accident, actually. I wasn't really thinking of um, leaving my country or changing anything until I got into the position that I needed to, to leave. I never, 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 th I never thought about leaving Cuba or leaving Balmesona de Cuba. But things um, in Cuba are not very easy. We mm. all know that. We struggle there a lot with a lot of um, issues, bureaucracy, and all the problems that the company has. And I got into a state where I needed a change, where I needed to find something else to do, and someone else to kind of show my my my, my art, my my dance. I need a new audience, if that makes sense. That makes sense, but did you have a happy childhood in Cuba? Yes, very happy. I was very happy. I am. A, I have a twin brother. I also have an older sister. My mom and dad, they are um, well professionals. They, my mom was um, a radio actress and my dad used to direct theatres and he used to direct a TV channel in Cuba and radio stations and things like that. So I come from a very cultural family, from a very artistic kind of family background. My brother was also an actor in Cuba. My sister also studied history of art. So everybody kind of was involved in, in the same kind of artistic side. And my childhood was, it, it was hard in a way that I had to kind of, um, find a way of making my own career, if that makes sense, because I'm from Santa Clara, it's a little town in the middle of the island, which the resources there are not the same as the one in Havana, for example, in the capital. And when I was 9, 10, 11, and I was kind of starting my, my dance career in Santa Clara, I didn't have enough resources, enough, um, everything was too little there. And I had to find a way how to move myself to Havana. And I found a way, and I found this auntie, like a third, fourth auntie, it was like my dad's cousin, cousin, cousin. It was, <laughs> I don't know how many cousins were there. And I just gave her, gave her a ring one day, and I said, listen, I need to move to Havana, because I want to make my career in Havana. I'm not gonna progress anything uh, if I don't move. And I was, I think it was 13 or 14. My dad, my mom and dad, I don't think they knew about this. And, she said, yes, why don't you come here and, you know, and do your thing. Also, my, my teacher at that point, she also suggested for me, if, she said, if you want to develop as a male dancer, you need to move to the capital because in Santa Clara, we had, for example, a group of 16 people. I was the only male in the, in the class. So I needed kind of to move and my auntie opened her house for me and I went, I went off by myself with 14 years old, I think. Um, and I started my, my new life in Havana. And after that, my mom and dad came after me, my sister came to university, my brother came to work in Havana as well. So I kind of moved the whole family after me to the capital and we started a new life as, as well together. So you're in a situation where your entire family had joined you in Havana and you were working, you were training at the mm. National Ballet School, and who were your teachers there? I had very good teachers at the school in Cuba, um, especially in Santa Clara. When I was in my little town, there was a person that really marked my career because she kind of, she, I think she, she saw my potential and she was the one that pushed me to kind of um, go further with it. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to Havana, my, my world and my perspective of dance training completely changed. The National Ballet of Cuba is one of the best school in the world. I would say it's the best, but I don't want any, um, 
you know, some some people don't don't think the Cuban training is the the most powerful one. I do think it's the most complete one, especially for male dancers. But anyways, that's another interview for that. Um, so when I go to to the national ballet uh, for, for the school, sorry, to the national school of um, ballet, my perspective changed because. That school at that point, we're talking about uh, 1994, 1995. Mm -hmm. In those days, the school was very little. It's not the, the massive building they have now with 4,000, 5,000 students. It was in a totally different location. Um, it was very um, centralized kind of education in a way. Yes. It was very hard. It was very hard. It was, it was very competitive. It was extremely competitive and you had to compete not only with your peers, with your other students, but you had to compete with the teachers as well. Because the teachers will, will have their own team in a way, their own kind of, uh, as, as it happens in every single dance school. Sure. The teachers have, you know, I like this one, this one and this one. And then the rest of the group is just, you know, they might, they might make a career. So I had to deal with that a lot and that was a very tough thing for me to deal with. And, but I think I did it well actually. And, and that kind of taught me how to, to, to push for what for I wanted, for what I wanted. And it kind of taught me how to, to see the career in a different way. In, I wanted to be better than I was yesterday every single day. And that kind of pushed me to to end the school, to finish the school, and to get into Bolognese de Cuba. But it was a really, really tough time in Havana, yeah. I suppose you discovered that uh, um, the dance world is also full of politics. And this is, I mean, this is a, it's a complex thing. It's not just mm -hmm. about danceability, mm -hmm. is it? It's about a, a particular mindset one has to develop to, to progress and to proceed. Uh, and of course, Alicia Alonso was the was the kind of matriarch who oversaw that entire system. And how did you get on with Alicia? Do you have a good relationship with her? Yes, I had the best relationship with Alicia. She changed my life completely because she gave me the opportunity to go to company. When I finished school and we went to, into the company, we were around 16 male dancers. At that point, now it's a little bit more structured and it's a little bit more connected. At that point, when I finished school, 1997, something, I can't remember what, the, what year it was, um, the school and the company, they are the same thing. They are connected, they are, you know, su supposedly together, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And whoever triumphs in the school, they, they, don't have, they wouldn't have to particularly kind of be accepted in the, in the company. Yes. So it was a very tough kind of road to get there. But once I got there, she gave me the opportunity to kind of to develop and she saw something on me as well. And because nobody saw that in school, I was of, out of 16 males in my group, I was always the number 16. Always, I was the, the bottom of the class all the time. Out of those 16 people, only 11 going to Balenciano de Cuba. I was one of them. And out of those 11 people, I was the only premier dancer in Balenciano de Cuba. So you can kind of imagine the, the process yeah. of one structure against the other structure. But your question was about Alicia and she, I said she gave me the opportunity to kind of um, develop myself because she, she was always very honest to me. And I was always very honest to her. And I think that's why our relationship kind of grow, uh, grew in a, in a different way. I had many, many um, um, stories with Alicia and things we had said to each other. But I always remember one that when I was um, my first year in the company, I think or second year, we had some issues with transport. We, have, we used to have a transport that, you know, dancers used to go to from home to the company with that local transport because this local um, transport in Cuba is really bad and you know so the company provides a bus so the dancers can go to their houses and things like that in the morning and in the evening so we used to have some issues with that transport and that was kind of a repetitive issue and one day I just knocked her office and I said I need to talk to you 
nobody would do that in Valencia de Cuba. That was, that was not allowed to do it. So I said, well, what I'm going to, I mean, I need to do it because the, this needs to get so, sorted. So I, when I was knocking the door, she was getting out of the office. And I straight went into it and I said, Alicia, hi, I'm Javier Torres, and I need to talk to you about this and this and this and this and this. And she was like a bit shocked. And the person that was with her, she always had a bodyguard in a way, not a bodyguard, but kind mm. of someone um, covering her. Mm. The person always, of, of course, that person always says, no, you can talk to her now. She needs to leave or whatever. There's always an excuse to get into, into Alicia's office. And she said, no, I want to listen to what, she ha what he has to say. So I explained to her the problem and she fixed the problem in literally five minutes. I don't know where she found that bus, but she found a bus and we, the dancers, we had that transport that day. That finished there. After a year or so, we had uh, our yearly meeting with, with her and I got into her office and she said to me, before we even started, she said to me, um, she, she um, gave me a, a different category. She kind of uh, said, I'm going to give you a soloist role, I think it was, a first soloist um, um, rank. Uh, but I want to let you know that this is not only because your, your, the work you've done in the company and because you deserve it and because you are a good dancer, but this is also because you remember that day two years ago or a year ago when we talked to me about the transport. And I was like, well, not really, but yeah. And she said, well, that day I saw you. Mm -hmm. That day I could see you, I could see you physically, I could see your, I could see your hair, your curly hair, I saw your eyes, mm -hmm. and I saw someone very sincere that came to me asking for, for help. And that day kind of marked me, and since that I've been following your career every single day. And that was quite a lot for me, and yeah, since then, then we kind of progressed with that relationship. And she always used to say that I was the most honest person in a way that I would go to her office and I would say things how they were and end of the story. And not, not everybody would do that in, in Cuba. Not everybody does it yet. So that's why the country is the way it is and the company is still kind of the way it is. But yeah. So in a way, it was because you weren't afraid of... Alicia, because she was a, a, was a very powerful figure in Cuba, and um, and I think uh, obviously you 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 penetrated her consciousness mm -hmm. in a in a way that she wasn't used to. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, really very interesting, actually. Yeah, I think it's 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 a matter of of trust. It's yes. a matter of I don't think it's being afraid of not being afraid. I think. I think what if one of if one of my core values, trust and loyalty with people. Yes. And I think it's, it was on her core values as well. And I trusted her to, yes. to solve my problem. And she did in a way. Yes. And I think those kind of connections with values are important between a director and a principal dancer or whatever, because that kind of set the base of what it's going to be. Do you think this is why Alicia was very open to the idea of you leaving Cuba to, to guest and to work. Um, but uh, how long were you with the, the Dancing with the Company full time? Sorry, I'm skipping I was, ahead. I was in Cuba for 10 years, nearly 11 years, yeah. Okay, and you were dancing principal roles? Yes, I got my um, principal rank in 2004, I think it was four years after I joined the company. Yes. And then after that, it took me five years to get my premier dancer rank. In Cuba, it's not like in different in, in companies around the world. We have premier dancer. Well, we have Alicia, which is prima ballerina. Yeah, yeah. We have premier dancer and principal dancer, and then all the other ranks. The difference between a premier dancer and a principal dancer is $5. That's it. That's, the, print, that's the, the difference. But those $5 made the difference yes. in companies like Balenciaga de Cuba. Yeah. So that, I think that's why it took me so long to get from principal dancer to premier dancer. But to be honest with you, I never was expecting to get to premier dancer because 
by the time I, I reached that position, I was already, um, I don't think fed up is the best word to use, but I was kind of, um, you know. Hungry. Yeah. You were hungry to yeah. go to, to do something, yeah, to yeah. go somewhere else, so yeah. So, in, of the roles you danced in Cuba, they were, they were mainly, I assume, classical ballets, you know, s princes and... What, what were your outstanding roles in Cuba for you? Um, yeah, we, we mainly do the classicals, as you know, but in my time in Cuba, we also used to do a lot of different stuff that now they don't kind of do it anymore. For example, I, I was well known in Cuba for Bhakti, Maurice Bajard. Yes. I was kind of well known from um, Blood Wedding, which is um, this Spanish choreographer, Antonio Gades. Yes. And Canto Vital, which is a um, vital song from yes. uh, Sari Blisetsky. Yes. So, apart from the classicals, we also do all these different things that nobody does around the world. And that, for me, it marked a before and after for my career. So, they first saw me with, on those roles, those legal roles, and then they gave me the, the princess, if that makes sense. And those other roles mm -hmm. involved a great deal of acting. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're dramatic, balance, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. So, was this something that you wanted to develop? Because there's not an awful lot, lot of range. For, for acting in, in classical roles. You know, a prince is a prince yeah. and there are yeah. certain mm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think one of the differences in, and I think Alicia also saw that on me, is that for me a prince wasn't a prince. I always gave a bit more than a prince and not all princes are the same princes. Okay. And I think it's very important to, to get that. And that was what I based my career on and I got where I got in Cuba because of that because I saw something different in every single role let's let's be honest I, I, I'm not the best dancer in the world I don't have the Cuban pirates I don't have the Cuban jumps I don't have the Cuban kind of um, I have the blood but I don't have that um, power that um, you know versatility of, of the Cuban dances. I was, in that way, I, was, I wasn't Cuban at all. So I had to find something else in my career that would give me an advantage from all the other dancers. And what I found was that, acting yes. and finding different ways of doing those roles that everybody does at the same, the same way. It's a good answer. <laughs> I, did, I did bait a hook with that one, but it was... <laughs> So, Javier, you started to guest outside of Cuba with other companies. And which companies did you visit first as a guest? Um, Most of the guesting in Cuba, to do guesting in Cuba, you have to have a very high negotiation skills yes. to go out of Cuba, especially you know, during my time in the company. Now it's different. And those galas were always kind of arranged by Cuban National Ballet. Right. So mostly I went loads to Spain. Um, we have a, a gala there, it's called Les Corial in, the, Les Corial in Madrid, which is um, one of the Alicia Alonso's kind of yearly galas. Um, I did a couple in Italy. I did um, mostly in Venezuela as well. I did a couple in America. So yeah, there were different Loads of galas, none of them big galas names, but they were uh, good enough for me to kind of see something else and to open my eyes and to, you know, uh, share with people and develop my experiences and things like that. Yeah. And you joined Northern Ballet in which year? When you made a joined break? Joined 2010. 2010. And you were a very different kind of dancer to the, the kind of dancer that they were employing in Northern Ballet at that time, because you came in to do Swan Lake, didn't yes. you? Yes, that was my first um, piece at Northern Ballet, and it was kind of a shock for me, because it was totally different than my Swan Lake, the Q1 one, and I thought that was the only Swan Lake in the world, and that was it, which is not. And, and that's one of the problems, actually, with Cuba, that 
they have so many good dancers there that they can do so many different styles, but they are still stuck in the past and they're still in that frame with what they should do, which I think is the moment now to break it and to go somewhere else. But anyways, back to Swan Lake and Northern Ballet. Yes, I was a totally different dancer. Okay. I was um, more a classical prince and more kind of um, dancer novel kind of yes. thing. And when I go to the Northern Ballet version of Swan Lake, I, I, I was a bit lost, to be honest. I was like, what the hell is this? People in bikes and, you know, Swan is not a swan, she's a woman. I was like, what? There's no um, black swans. It's just, uh, it was too confusing for me. <laughs> but I did it. And I think it was, it was an eye opening for me, an eye opener for me to, to kind of find something else that I could do. And it, it, it kind of gave me that um, reassurance that I could do something else. Yes. And that was when I, when I thought, well, then let's try and, and, and do something else. Because yeah. that's one like was a, a baptism of fire in a way, because yeah. it was so different to what you were. It, it wasn't is. as if there were just a few. No, no, it was completely, it was from, from black to white. It was yes. a completely different version, a completely different story, different steps, different musicality. And for me, the hardest thing for me was to get out of my prince, because it's not a prince. Yes. Anthony is not a prince. Yes. So, I was I struggled with that so much, and I had it kind of in my blood. I had it in my body, and I just listened to Swan Lake music, and I am a prince straight away, yes. which is, it could not happen with this version. Yes. And that took me months, and I think years to kind of get rid of. But I'm glad I got rid of. <laughs> but the curious thing is, you you are a a versatile dancer now because you can still do those premier danse noble roles, but you also play a wonderful villain. You, you were a wonderful Tybalt. And in, in um, 1984, you were a very sinister villain. And it's, um, do you enjoy those roles better <laughs> than the Prince roles? I love them, yeah. I love the roles because um, those are the roles that that tells you what you can do with your acting and that pushes you to do something different. Yes. And I've done all the princes now, I've done, you know, everything else. So those little roles, which are not very little at all, are the ones that kind of gave me um, the possibilities of creating the dancer of the dancers that I am and of going out of my comfort zone as a dancer and create those roles based on acting instead of dancing. So yeah, I love them, I love them. And I don't know why, for some reason, they always give them to me. <laughs> because you have a very wide spectrum of, of roles now. Mm. You know, you're a very adaptable dancer. You're, you're, you're a utility dancer in a way that you can, you can play these romantic princes, but you can also play the villains. Mm. Most dancers fall into one yeah. category, you know, a demi character mm. or, or, or another. But you have the ability to, to do all of them now. And, and I think that's partly because of your Cuban training and partly to do with the company that you're performing with now, which is a very dramatic company, you know, great dance actors in that company. And of course, uh, you were seen on television recently playing Dracula in David Nixon's Dracula. And that was a very meaty role, a very substantial role. And it was one that required a, a high degree of concentration because it's a very intense part. The, the actual characterization is very intense and you're on stage so much of the time. Mm. Um, did you find that an exhausting role to dance? Yes, it was, um, especially the first time I did it four years ago, maybe five years ago, um, it was very exhausting because um, the process of, we have very good thing, we have a very good thing on Northern Ballet, which is the process of how you learn the role and how you develop your role. So those processes have changed from 2010 to 2020. So the first time I learned it, it was very difficult for me to get into the role. It was, I didn't, I didn't see myself playing the Dracula. I, was, I, I felt stupid playing it. I felt I wasn't given what it needed. I didn't have that um, 
the look, I didn't have the, you know, the ability to play someone like him. Yes. But then a couple of years later, now, when I took the role for a second time, it was like a whole transformation for me. It's, it's been actually one of my favorite roles so far at Northern Valley, because I don't know why, by I think it was the process of how we created Dracula this time that made me fell in love with the role. And I don't know if because I understood better the role or because I gave those 20 years of experience I have now into one role. But whatever it was, it gave me a totally different vision of what you can do with a, a role that you're not comfortable with. Yeah. And I, I can tell you now that I feel comfortable doing Dracula as I felt comfortable 15 years ago doing Giselle. Like, it's, it's, I could not tell you which one is, you know, is more comfortable for me. And yeah, it's a very hard kind of role to do because you always have to be careful with the balance between the human and the, and the vampire. And that balance, once you cross that line, you're completely gone. So you have to be very careful how, how you control the emotions of the vampire not to become human. And that was one of the hardest things for me to control because I'm a very emotional and, and passionate kind of dancer. Yes. And you cannot put that into Dracula at all. The passion of Dracula is a different kind of passion. So yeah, it was it was it was really good, I, and I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. And so you're dancing a very wide spectrum of roles. You are a very successful performer with Northern Ballet, and but you also you also now have an English passport, don't you? I am a uh, I'm a Yorkshireman. You're I'm a Yorkshireman. A, a, <laughs> I'm a British uh, citizen, yeah, yeah. It was a long, long, long way to get there, but I got there and I think that was, um, I'm very proud of it, I have to say, because that has also changed my life. Um, I cannot tell you how, how frustrating it is to go through a, a security um, thing in the airport or whatever and showing a Cuban passport, yeah. especially on the other side of the world in America and things like that. They always, they always see you as the criminal, as the communist, as the, you know, all those kind of things. And I struggle loads with that, with my freedom, because my passport was blue. Yes. So since I got my bug on the passport, the British one, my, my life has changed. And yes. it sounds ridiculous, but it has changed a lot. Yes. Because I can feel now I got my freedom back as a person, as a citizen, and... And it's very, very sad, the fact that people in Cuba have still to deal with this, with this kind of, um, you know, um, differences and all these kind of issues because they have a Cuban passport. So, yeah. It's a sense of liberation, I yeah. think, is, is very important for an artist, yeah. actually. Yeah. This, is, this is why the Soviet Union lost uh, Nureyev and Boris. Exactly, and exactly. The Bakarra. same in Cuba. The same in Cuba. That's why they has lost so many dancers. Yes. Because the sense of freedom, there's a, mo there's a moment in life where you, you can handle it so long, for so long. But there's a moment in life when you, can, you need your freedom back. Yes. And, and that was also another reason why I left Cuba. Because it was not only professional reasons, it was personal yes. in that sense. Yes. And I wanted to fight for, for my freedom because the problem with Cuba is that you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you don't know any, that in, in any country, yes. but especially in Cuba, the uncertainty is just too much. You, you, it's sometimes impossible to live with the uncertainty of what's going to happen in the country as a country. And yet you've been, uh, you've been loyal to your Cuban origins and you return to Cuba, you yes. dance in Cuba, um, because um, Alicia's um, festival in Havana, is it every year? It's every two years. Every two years. And you, you've been a very frequent and welcome guest there. And you've taken a different repertoire to uh, what people are used to seeing in Cuba, yeah. which I think is important. Uh, do you think that will continue now that Alicia is no longer with us? I hope so. I will fight as much as I can to, to keep that going. Unfortunately, this year, the festival has been cancelled. Yes. Uh, so that is it's not very good. Um, 
but we all understand the situation and it's un understandable. Um, I think it's the first time in 50 odd years that the festival has been cancelled. But yes, I one of my deals with Alicia was that, and I, actually that was Alicia's deal with me. She said, you can go, you can go to Northern Bali, you can do your career somewhere else, but you need to come back to the festival every two years because you are a Cuban dancer and we want to see you here. And that was the best deal not anybody has done to me, yes. never ever. So, and I signed the deal straight away, you know. So, and since then I've been back every two years in every single ballet festival, I go back and I try to show something different. As you said, the Cuban audience never will see there because the company doesn't have the abilities or the resources to do it or mm -hmm. the interest of doing those kind of things. So I always try to bring back new dancers, new choreographies and something new for the Cuban audience because I think it's important for them to to open that um, that area of dancing that they don't know yet. I think an interesting thing about you, Javier, is that you you don't seem to lack courage into going into areas that that are new, and of course, you when you finally decide to stop dancing, of course, you're you're going to be moving into different areas. But you are a very intelligent, ambitious man, Thank and you. you clearly have plans to to do something new and exciting when you decide to hang up your dancing shoes. So could you tell us something about your plans for the future? Yeah, um, that's important that you said that you, you need to know what you want and, and things like that. And I think this is like a kind of an advice for young dancers. I think it's very important for your dancers to, to know where your roof is and where your, your line is, where you can go, not just as a person, but as a dancer, as an artist. It's very important to know what you can do. And I think I learned that in Cuba. I knew I wasn't a very kind of Cuban sort of dancer in that way. So I had to find a different way of portraying myself. Yes. And because, that's because I knew where, I, where was my line, what I could do and what I could not do. And the same is happening now for my next step in my career. I know what I want. I want to direct a dance organization, either a ballet company or a ballet school. I am very passionate about leadership and what, can lead, what, what leadership can do for dancers. I have great leaders during my career that have changed my life, like Alicia Alonso, for example. Yeah. And I know how important it is to, to, to get that sense of, of power, that sense of um, liberation to dancers, that sense of autonomy and you know, give them tools and resources so they can develop. And I'm very passionate about that with young people, with young dancers. So that's what I want to do when I get retired, maybe in a couple of years or so. And in order to do that, I know or I knew in the past that I wasn't completely ready to, to kind of um, take one of those roles on board. So since 2016, I've been preparing myself. I've about, I'm about to finish my uh, bachelor uh, degree in business management and leadership. And I also started my master's in business administration with the University of Cumbria uh, two weeks ago, no, four weeks ago. So yeah, I'm dancing and doing a bachelor and a master at the same time. It's a little bit crazy, uh, but it goes back to, to what you were saying about knowing your limits and knowing where you can go and how you're going to get there. So I know where I want to go. I know where I need to learn to get there. And that is hopefully what I'm doing now to, to go there. That's wonderful. And, you know, I think that most dancers at the beginning of their career have no idea what they're going to do at the end of their career. So uh, I really think, you know, dancers ought to be, they need to be trained really to, th to think about what they're going to do after that, after the dance career, because it's, it's, um, it would save an awful lot of trauma. Um, and it's because I think most dancers are, are trained just to think about the dance career and nothing else. And, uh, but clearly you are, are, are quite different from that point of view. 
that you, you always have your eye on the future, you always have your eye on, on where you're going. So, and I think that will probably equip you to be a very good artistic director. And uh, particularly, since, you know, your comments about leadership and caring about young people. Um, I think it's very interesting what you have to say about that. And, uh, you know, power to your elbow. Would you, would you want to um, direct a company in this country or would that be immaterial to you? Of course, yeah. I love England. That's why I came in here to live. Yeah. Even though we don't have the, the sun I had in Havana, but I love this country and I am a British citizen. Yes. So why not? I would love to stay in this country. My life is now in this country. My life belongs to this country yes. and I don't want to change that. However, I'm open for any opportunities and for anything that will come, you know, to my way. So I'm open for anything. And what you say about the training is very important. And I want to say something about that because I think dance organizations need to understand the importance of developing their dancers, not just as dancers, but as human beings and as something else apart from dancing. And one of the things I will first do if I ever become an artistic director is to create training programs within the company so dancers can have an idea, have, have that um, vision of what they want to do with their own lives. Yeah. And, and as you said, I think it's very traumatic because I'm, I am going through this now, to the trauma of I know what I want to do with my life, however I know that to, to get there I need to go through a lot of things that I would, have, I, w I would love to have that knowledge that I have now and those resources when I was 24 and, and I, would, I would have loved to have the opportunity to have a master and to know what I wanted to do with my life when I was 24. Yes. So now I wouldn't have to go through what I'm going now in terms of uh, changing careers and looking for new perspectives and things like that. However, in order to, to do that, I think dance organizations have the responsibility to train their dancers in that. And I think, for example, um, Dance Career Development, ha they are doing an amazing job on that, but I don't think it's enough. I think it comes from the artistic directors, from the chief executive of the company, to kind of to create something with their own employees, with their own dancers. There's a lot of dancers that have many, many skills, soft, hard skills that they can use doing something else within the company. If you train those people during the time they're dancing, yeah. then you can use those people to your own benefit for your own organization. So that's how I see it. I probably, I would probably be wrong, I don't know. But that's how I see it. And I think it's important to understand how can we do of a dancer something else but a dancer. Because a dancer is something else than dancers. If once you can dance, you can do whatever you want.